Welcome to a livid Anglo reading of Ideas Have Consequences by Richard M. Weaver. Publishing credits for this book are credited to the Classics of Liberty Library and the University of Chicago Press. Publication rights 1948 and reprint rights 2015. Forward. When Ideas Have Consequences was published in 1948, it met a response far beyond anything anticipated by the author. The book was written in the period immediately following the Second World War, and it was in a way a reaction to that war, to its immense destructiveness, to the strain it placed upon ethical principles, and to the tensions it left in place of the peace and order that were professedly sought. Its rhetorical note may perhaps be explained by this, but many people have written to me to say they have found their own thoughts expressed in the book, and therefore tried to understand its appeal by asking myself whether it can really be considered a work of philosophy. It is a work of philosophy to the extent that it tries to analyze many features of modern disintegration by referring them to a first cause. This was a change that overtook the dominant philosophical thinking of the West in the 14th century. When the reality of transcendentals was first seriously challenged. To many readers, this has been the most unsatisfactory part of the reasoning. But to others, it has, seemingly, been the most convincing. I will merely say that something like this is necessary if one believes in the primacy of ideas. I was attempting a rigorous cause-and-effect analysis of the decline of belief in standards and values, and there must be a starting point. I have come to feel increasingly, however, that this is not primarily a work of philosophy. This is rather an intuition of a situation. The intuition is of a world which has lost its center, but desires to believe again in value and obligation. But this world is not willing to realize how it has lost its belief, or to face what it must accept in order to regain faith in an order of goods. The dilemma is very widely felt, and I image this accounts for the interest of the book to many persons who would not be at all happy with the political implications of some of the conclusions. In a more general revision, I would very probably change a few matters of emphasis and try to find a less topical application for some of the ideas, but I see no reason, after the lapse of more than a decade, to retreat from the general position of social criticism. It seems to me that the world is now more than ever dominated by the gods of mass and speed, and that the worship of these can lead only the lowering of standards, the adulteration of quality, and, in general, to the loss of those things which are essential to the life of civility and culture. The tendency to look with suspicion upon excellence, both intellectual and moral, as undemocratic, shows no sign of diminishing. The book was intended as a challenge to forces that threaten the foundations of civilization, and I'm very happy to see it appear in a more accessible edition. Richard M. Weaver Introduction This is another book about the disillusion of the West. I attempt two things not commonly found in the growing literature of this subject. First, I present an account of the decline based not on analogy, but on deduction. It is here the assumption that the world is intelligible and that man is free and that those consequences we are now expiating are the product of not biological or other necessity, but of unintelligent choice. Second, I go so far as to propound, if not a whole solution, at least the beginning of one in the belief that man should not follow a scientific analysis with a plea of moral impotence. In considering the world to which these matters are addressed, 
I have been chiefly impressed by the difficulty of getting certain initial facts admitted. This difficulty is due in part to the widely prevailing Whig theory of history, which its belief that the most advanced point in time represents the point of highest development, aided no doubt by theories of evolution, which suggest to the uncritical a kind of necessary passage from simple to complex. Yet the real trouble is found to lie deeper than this. It is the appalling problem when one comes to actual cases of getting men to distinguish between better and worse. Are people today provided with a sufficiently rational scale of values to attach these predicates with intelligence? There is ground for declaring that modern man has become a moral idiot. So few are those who care to examine their lives or accept the rebuke which comes of admitting that our present state may be a fallen state, that one questions whether people now understand what is meant by the superiority of an ideal. One might expect abstract reasoning to be lost upon them, but what is he to think when attestations of the most concrete kind are set before them, and they are still powerless to mark a difference or to draw a lesson. For four centuries, every man has been not only his own priest, but his own professor of ethics, and the consequence is an anarchy which threatens even that minimum consensus of value necessary to the political state. Surely we are justified in saying of our time, if you seek the monument to our folly, look about you. In our own day, we have seen cities obliterated and ancient faiths stricken. We may well ask, in the words of Matthew, whether we are not faced with the great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world. We have, for many years, moved with a brash confidence that man had achieved a position of independence, which rendered the ancient restraints needless. Now, in the first half of the 20th century, at the height of modern progress, we behold unprecedented outbreaks of hatred and violence. We have seen whole nations desolated by war and turned into penal camps by their conquerors. We find half of mankind looking upon the other half as criminal. Everywhere occur symptoms of mass psychosis. Most portentous of all, there appear diverging bases of value, so that our single planetary globe is mocked by worlds of different understanding. These signs of disintegration arouse fear, and fear leads to desperate unilateral efforts towards survival which only forward the process. Like Macbeth, Western man made an evil decision, which has become the efficient and final cause of other evil decisions. Have we forgotten our encounter with the witches on the heath? It occurred in the late 14th century, and what the witches said to the protagonist of this drama was that man could realize himself more fully if he would only abandon his belief in the existence of transcendentals. The powers of darkness were working subtly, as always, and they couched this proposition in the seemingly innocent form of an attack upon universals. The defeat of logical realism in the great medieval debate was the crucial event in the history of Western culture. From this flowed those acts which issue now in modern decadence. One may be accused here of oversimplifying the historical process, but I take the view that the conscious policies of men and governments are not mere rationalizations of what has been brought about by unaccountable forces. They are rather deductions from our most basic ideas of human destiny. And they have a great, though not unobstructed, power to determine our course. For this reason, I turn to William of Ockham as the best representative of change which came over man's conception of reality at this historic juncture. 
It is William of Ockham who propounded the faithful doctrine of nominalism, which denies that universals have a real existence. His triumph tended to leave universal terms mere names, serving our convenience. The issue ultimately involved is whether there is a source of truth higher than and independent of man. And the answer to the question is decisive for one's view of the nature and destiny of humankind. The practical result of nominalist philosophy is to banish the reality which is perceived by the intellect and to posit it as reality that which is perceived by the senses. With this change in the affirmation of what is real, the whole orientation of culture takes a turn, and we are on the road to modern empiricism. It is easy to be blind to the significance of a change, because it is remote in time and abstract in character. Those who have not discovered that worldview is the most important thing about a man, as about the men composing a culture should consider the train of circumstances which have, with the perfect logic, proceeded from this. The denial of universals carries with it the denial of everything transcending experience. The denial of everything transcending experience means, inevitably, though ways are found to hedge on this, the denial of truth. With the denial of objective truth, there is no escape from the relativism of Man, the measure of all things. The witches spoke with a habitual equivocation of oracles when they told man that by this easy choice, he might realize himself more fully, for they were actually initiating a course which cuts one off from the reality. Thus began the abomination of desolation. Appearing today, as a feeling of alienation from all fixed truth, because a change of belief so profound eventually influences every concept, there emerged before long a new doctrine of nature. Whereas nature had formerly been regarded as imitating a transcendent model and as constituting an imperfect reality, it was henceforth looked upon as containing the principles of its own constitution and behavior. Such revision has had two important consequences for philosophical inquiry. First, it encouraged a careful study of nature, which has come to be known as science, on the supposition that by her act she revealed her essence. Second, and by the same operation, it did away with the doctrine of forms, imperfectly realized. Aristotle had recognized an element of unintelligibility in the world, but the view of nature as a rational mechanism expelled this element. The expulsion of the element of unintelligibility in nature was followed by the abandonment of the doctrine of original sin. If physical nature is the totality, and if man is of nature, it is impossible to think of him as suffering from constitutional evil. His defections must now be attributed to his simple ignorance or to some kind of social deprivation. One comes thus, by clear deduction, to the corollary of the natural goodness of men. And the end is not yet. If nature is a self-operating mechanism and man is a rational animal adequate to his needs, it is next in order to elevate rationalism to the rank of a philosophy. Since man proposed now not to go beyond the world, it was proper that he should regard as his highest intellectual vocation methods of interpreting data supplied by the senses. There followed the transition to Hobbes and Locke, and the 18th century rationalists who taught that man needed only to reason correctly upon evidence from nature. The question of what the world was made for now becomes meaningless because the asking of it presupposes something prior to nature and the order of existence. Thus it is not the mysterious fact of the world's existence which interests the new man, but explanations of how the world works. This is the rational basis for modern science, 
whose systemization of phenomena is, as Bacon declared in the New Atlantis, a means to dominion. At this stage, religion begins to assume an ambiguous dignity, and the question of whether it can endure at all in a world of rationalism and science has to be faced. One solution was deism, which makes God the outcome of a rational reading of nature. But this religion, like all those which deny antecedent truth, was powerless to bind. It merely left each man to make what he could of the world open to senses. There followed references to, quote, nature and nature's god, unquote, and the anomaly of a humanized religion. Materialism loomed next on the horizon, for it was implicit in what had already been framed. Thus, it soon became imperative to explain man by his environment, which was the work of Darwin and the others in the 19th century. It is further significant of the per character of these changes, that several other students were arriving at similar explanations when Darwin published in 1859. If men came into the century trailing clouds of transcendental glory, he was now accounted for in a way that would satisfy the positivists. With a human being thus firmly ensconced in nature, it at once became necessary to question the fundamental character of his motivation. Biological necessity, issuing the survival of the fittest, was offered as the causa causans after the important question of human origin had been decided in favor of scientific materialism. After it has been granted that man is molded entirely by environmental pressures, one is obligated to extend the same theory of causality to his institutions. The social philosophers of the 19th century found in Darwin powerful support for their thesis that human beings act always out of economic incentives. And it was they who completed the abolishment of freedom of the will. The great pageant of history thus became reducible to the economic endeavors of individuals and classes. An elaborate prognosis were constructed on the theory of economic conflict and resolution. Man created in the divine image, the protagonist of a great drama which his soul was at stake, was replaced by man, the wealth-seeking and consuming animal. Finally came psychological behaviorism, which denied not only freedom of the will, but even such elementary means of direction as instinct, because the scandalous nature of this theory is quickly apparent. It failed to win converts in such numbers as the others. Yet it is only a logical extension of them, and should in fairness be embraced by the upholders of material causation. Essentially, it is reduction to absurdity of the line of reasoning, which began when man bade a cheerful goodbye to the concept of transcendence. There is no proper term to describe the condition in which he is now left, unless it be abysmality. He is in the deep and dark abysm, and he has nothing with which to raise himself. His life is practiced without theory. As problems crowd upon him, he deepens confusion by meeting them with ad hoc policies. Secretly, he hungers for truth, but consoles himself with the thought that life should be experimental. He sees his institutions crumbling and rationalizes with talk of emancipation. Wars have to be fought, seemingly with increased frequency. Therefore, he revives the old ideals, ideals which his present assumptions actually render meaningless, and by the machinery of state forces them again to do service. He struggles with the paradox that total immersion in matter unfits him to deal with the problems of matter. His decline can be represented 
as a long series of abdications. He has found less and less ground for authority. At the same time, he thought he was setting himself up at the center of authority in the universe. Indeed, there seems to exist here a dialectic process which takes away his power and proportion as he demonstrates that his independence entitles him to power. This story is eloquently reflected in changes that have come over education. The shift from truth of the intellect to the facts of experience followed hard upon meeting with the witches. A little sign appears, quote, a cloud no bigger than a man's head, end quote. In a change that came over the study of logic in the 14th century, the century of Occam, logic became grammaticized, passing from a science which taught men vere loqui to one that taught recte loqui, or from an ontological division by categories to a study of signification, with the inevitable focus upon historical meanings. Here begins the assault upon definition. If words no longer correspond to objective realities, it seems no great wrong to take liberties with words. From this point on, faith in language as a means of arriving at truth weakens, until our own age, filled with an acute sense of doubt, looks for a remedy in the new science of semantics. So, with the subject matter of education, the Renaissance increasingly adapted its course of study to produce a successful man of the world, though it did not leave him without philosophy and the graces, for it was still, by heritage at least, an ideational world, and was therefore near enough transcendental conceptions to perceive the dehumanizing effects of specialization. In the 17th century, physical discovery paved the way for the incorporation of the sciences, although it was not until the 19th that these began to challenge the very continuance of the ancient intellectual disciplines. And in this period, the change gained momentum, aided by two developments of overwhelming influence. The first was a patent increase in man's dominion over nature, which dazzled all, but the most thoughtful. And the second was the growing mandate for popular education. The latter might have proved it good itself, but it was wrecked on the equalitarian democracy's unsolvable problem of authority. None was in a position to say what the hungering multitudes were to be fed. Finally, in an abject surrender to the situation, in an abdication of the authority of knowledge, came the elective system. This was followed by a carnival of specialism, professionalism, and vocationalism, often fostered and protected by strange bureaucratic devices, so that, on the honored name of university, there traded a weird congeries of interests, not a few of which were anti-intellectual. Even in their pretensions, institutions of learning did not check, but rather contributed to the decline by losing interest in Homo sapiens to develop Homo faber. Studies pass into habits, and it is easy to see those changes reflected in the dominant type of leader from epic to epic. In the 17th century, it was, on one side, the royalist and learned defender of the faith, and on the other, aristocratic intellectuals of the type of John Milton and the Puritan theocrats who settled in New England. The next century saw the domination of the Whigs in England and the rise of encyclopedists and romanticists on the continent. Men who were not without intellectual background, but who assiduously cut the mooring strings to reality as they succumbed to the delusion that man is by nature good. Frederick the Great's rebuke to sentimentalists Ach, mein lieber Sozier, in Kant nicht diese verdammte Roche, epitomizes the difference between the two outlooks. The next period witnessed the rise of the popular leader 
in the demagogue, typical foe of privilege, who broadened the franchise in England and wrought revolution on the continent, and in the United States replaced the social order, which the founding fathers had contemplated, ushered in the leader of the masses, though at this point there occurs a split whose deep significance we shall have occasion to note. The new prophets of reform divide sharply into sentimental humanitarians and an elite group of remorseless theorists who pride themselves on their freedom from sentimentality. Hating this world they never made, after its debauchery of centuries, the modern communists, revolutionaries and logicians, move toward intellectual rigor. In their decision lies the sharpest reproach yet to the desertion of intellect by Renaissance man and his successors. Nothing is more disturbing to modern men of the West than the logical clarity with which the communist faces all problems. Who shall say that this feeling is not born of a deep apprehension, that here are the first true realists in hundreds of years, and that no dodging about in the excluded middle will save Western liberalism? This story of man's passage from religious or philosophical transcendentalism has been told many times, and, since it has usually been told as a story of progress, it is extremely difficult today to get people in any number to see contrary implications. Yet to establish the fact of decadence is the most pressing duty of our time, because until we have demonstrated that cultural decline is a historical fact which can be established, and that modern man has about squandered his estate. We cannot combat those who have fallen prey to hysterical optimism. Such as the task, and our most serious obstacle is, that people traveling this downward path develop an insensibility, which increases their degradation. Loss is perceived most clearly at the beginning. After habit becomes implanted, one beholds the anomalous situation of apathy, mounting as the moral crisis deepens. It is when the first faint warnings come that one has the best chance to save himself, and this, I suspect, explains why medieval thinkers were extremely agitated over questions which seem to us today without point or relevance. If one goes on, the monitory voices fade out, and it is not possible for him to reach a state in which his entire moral orientation is lost. Thus, the face of the enormous brutality of our age, we seem unable to make appropriate response to perversions of truth and acts of bestiality. Multiplying instances show complacency in the presence of contradiction which denies the heritage of Greece, and a callousness to suffering which denies the spirit of Christianity. Particularly since the Great Wars do we observe this insentience. We approach a condition in which we shall be amoral without the capacity to perceive it, and degraded without means to measure our descent. That is why, when we reflect upon the cataclysms of the age, we are chiefly impressed with the failure of men to rise to the challenge of them. In the past, great calamities have called forth, if not great virtues, at least heroic postures. But after the awful judgments pronounced against men and nations in recent decades, we detect notes of triviality and travesty. A strange disparity has developed between the drama of these actions and the conduct of the protagonists. And we have the feeling of watching actors who do not comprehend their roles. Hysterical optimism will prevail until the world again admits the existence of tragedy. 
and it cannot admit the existence of tragedy until it again distinguishes between good and evil. Hope of restoration depends upon recovery of the ceremony of innocence, of that clearness of vision and knowledge of form which enables us to sense what is alien or destructive. What does not comport with our mortal ambition, the time to seek this is now, before we have acquired the perfect insouciance of those who prefer perdition. For, as the course goes on, the movement turns centrifugal. We rejoice in our abandon, and are never so full of the sense of accomplishment as when we have struck some bulwark of our culture, a deadly blow. In view of these circumstances, it is no matter for surprise that when we ask people even to consider the possibility of decadence, we meet incredulity and resentment. We must consider that we are in effect asking for a confession of guilt and an acceptance of sterner obligation. We're making demands in the name of an ideal or the supra-personal. And we cannot expect a more cordial welcome than disturbers of complacency have received in any other age. On the contrary, our welcome will rather be less today, for a century and a half of bourgeois ascendancy has produced a type of mind highly unreceptive to unsettling thoughts. Added to this is the egotism of modern men, fed by many springs, which will scarcely permit the humility needed for self-criticism. The apostles of modernism usually begin their retort with the catalogs of modern achievement, not realizing that here they bear witness to their immersion in particulars. We must remind them that we cannot begin to enumerate until we have defined what is to be sought or proved. It will not suffice to point out the inventions and processes of our century unless it can be shown that they are something other than a splendid efflorescence of decay. Whoever conspires to praise some modern achievement should wait until he has related it to the professed aims of our civilization as rigorously as the schoolmen related a corollary to their doctrine of the nature of God. All demonstrations lacking this are pointless. If it can be agreed, however, that we are to talk about ends before means, we may begin by asking some perfectly commonplace questions about the condition of modern man. Let us first of all inquire whether he knows more, or is on the whole wiser than his predecessors. This is a weighty consideration, and if the claim of the modern to know more is correct, our criticism falls to the ground, for it is hardly to be imagined that a people who have been gaining in knowledge over the centuries have chosen an evil course. Naturally, Everything depends on what we mean by knowledge. I shall adhere to the classic proposition that there is no knowledge at the level of sensation. Therefore, knowledge is of universals. And that whatever we know as a truth enables us to predict. The process of learning involves interpretation. And the fewer particulars we require in order to arrive at our generalizations the more apt pupils are in the school of wisdom. The whole tendency of modern thought, one might say, its whole moral impulse is to keep the individual busy with endless induction. Since the time of Bacon, the world has been running away from, rather than toward, first principles, so that on the verbal level we see fact substituted for truth, and on the philosophic level, we witness attack upon abstract ideas and speculative inquiry. 
The unexpressed assumption of empiricism is that experience will tell us what we are experiencing. In the popular arena, one can tell from certain newspaper columns and radio programs that the average man has become imbued with this notion and imagines that an industrious acquisition of particulars will render him a man of knowledge. With what pathetic trust does he recite his facts? He's been told that knowledge is power, and knowledge consists of a great many small things. Thus, the shift from speculative inquiry to investigation of an experience has left modern man so swamped with multiplicities that he no longer sees his way. By this we understand Gautier's dictum that one may be said to know much only in the sense that he knows little. If our contemporary belongs to a profession, he may be able to describe some tiny bit of the world with minute fidelity, but he still lacks understanding. There can be no truth under a program of separate sciences, and his thinking will be invalidated as soon as ab extra relationships are introduced. The world of modern knowledge is like the universe of Eddington, expanding by diffusion until it approaches the point of nullity. What the defenders of present civilization usually mean when they say that modern man is better educated than his forebears is that he is literate in larger numbers. The literacy can be demonstrated, yet one may question whether there has ever been a more deceptive panacea, and we are compelled, after a hundred years of experience, to echo Nietzsche's bitter observation, quote, Everyone being allowed to learn to read ruineth in the long run not only writing, but also thinking. End quote. It is not what people can read, it is what they do read, and what they can be made by any imaginable means to learn from what they read that determine the issue of this noble experiment. We have given them a technique of acquisition. How much comfort can we take in the way they employ it? In a society where expression is free and popularity is rewarded, they read mostly that which debauches them, and they are continuously exposed to manipulation by controllers of the printing machine, as I shall seek to make clear in a later passage. It may be doubted whether one person in three draws what may be correctly termed knowledge from his freely chosen reading matter, the staggering number of facts to which he today has access serves only to draw him away from consideration of his principles, so that his orientation becomes peripheral, and looming above all as a reminder of this fatuity is the tragedy of modern Germany, the one totally literate nation now, those who side with the Baconians in preferring shoes to philosophy will answer that this is an idle complaint, because the true glory of modern civilization is that man has perfected his material estate to a point at which he is provided for, and probably it could be shown statistically that the average man today in countries not desolated by war, has more things to consume than his forebears. On this, however, there are two important comments to be made. The first is that since modern man has not defined his way of life, he initiates himself into an endless series when he enters the struggle for an adequate living. One of the strangest disparities of history lies between the sense of abundance felt by older and simpler societies and the sense of scarcity 
felt by the ostensibly richer societies of today. Charles Pigley has referred to modern man's feeling of slow economic strangulation. His sense of never having enough to meet the requirements which his pattern of life imposes on him, standards of consumption which he cannot meet and which he does not need to meet, come virtually in the guise of duties. As the abundance for simple living is replaced by the scarcity for complex living, it seems that, in some way, not yet explained, we have formalized prosperity until it is for most people only a figment of the imagination. Certainly the case of the Baconians is not one until it has been proven that the substitution of covetousness for want wellness of an ascending spiral of desires for a stable requirement of necessities leads to the happier condition. Suppose, however, we ignore this feeling of frustration and turn our attention to the fact that by comparison, modern man has more. This very circumstance sets up a conflict, for it is a constant law of human nature that the more a man has to indulge in, the less disposed he is to endure the discipline of toil. That is to say, the less willing he is to produce that which is to be consumed. Labor ceases to be functional in life. It becomes something that is grudgingly traded for that competence or that superfluity which everyone has a right to. A society spoiled in this manner may be compared to a drunkard. The more he imbibes, the less he is able to work and acquire the means to indulge his habit. A great material establishment, by its very temptation to luxuriousness, unfits the owner for the labor necessary to maintain it. As has been observed countless times in the histories of individuals and of nations. But let us waver all particular considerations of this sort and ask whether modern man, for reasons apparent or obscure, feels an increased happiness. We must avoid superficial conceptions of this state and look for something fundamental. I should be willing to accept Aristotle's quote, feeling of conscious vitality, end quote. Does he feel equal to life? Does he look upon it as does a strong man upon a race? First one must take into account the deep psychic anxiety, the extraordinary prevalence of neurosis, which make our age unique. The typical modern has the look of the hunted. He senses that we have lost our grip upon reality. This in turn produces disintegration, and disintegration leaves impossible that kind of reasonable prediction by which men in eras of sanity are able to order their lives. And in the fear accompanying it unlooses the great disorganizing force of hatred, so that states are threatened and wars ensue. Few men today feel certain that war will not wipe out their children's inheritance, and even if this evil is held in abeyance, the individual does not rest easy, for he knows that the juggernaut technology may twist or destroy the pattern of life he has made for himself. A creature designed to look before and after finds that to do the latter has gone out of fashion, and that to do the former is becoming impossible. Added to this is another deprivation. Man is constantly being assured today that he has more power than ever before in history. But his daily experience is one of powerlessness. Look at him today, somewhere in the warren of great city. If he is with a business organization, the odds are great that he has sacrificed every other kind of independence in return for that dubious one known as financial. 
modern social and corporate organization makes independence an expensive thing. In fact, it may make common integrity a prohibitive luxury for the ordinary man. As Stuart Chase has shown, not only is this man likely to be a slavery at his place of daily toil, but he is cribbed, cabined, and confined in countless ways, many of which are merely devices to make possible, physically, the living together of masses. Because these are deprivations of what is rightful, the end is frustration. And hence, the look upon the faces of those whose souls have not already become minuscule of hunger and unhappiness. There are some questions that should be put to the eulogists of progress. It will certainly be objected that the decadence of a present age is one of the permanent illusions of mankind. It is said that each generation feels it with reference to the next in the same way that parents can never quite trust the competence of their children to deal with the great world. In reply, we must affirm that given the conditions described, each successive generation does show decline in the sense that it stands one step nearer the abysm. When change is in progress, every generation will average an extent of it, and that some cultures have passed from a high state of organization to disillusion can be demonstrated as objectively as anything in history. One has only to think of Greece, of Venice, of Germany. The assertion that changes from generation to generation are illusory, and that there exist only cycles of biological reproduction, is another form of denial of standards, and ultimately of knowledge, which lies at the source of our degradation. Civilization has been an intermittent phenomenon. To this truth, we have allowed ourselves to be blinded by the insolence of material success. Many late societies have displayed a pyrotechnic brilliance and a capacity for refined sensation far beyond anything seen in their days of vigor. That such things may exist and yet work against that estate of character concerned with choice, which is the anchor of society, is the great lesson to be learned. In the final reach of analysis, our problem is how to recover that intellectual integrity which enables men to perceive the order of goods. The opening chapter, therefore, attempts to set forth the ultimate source of our feeling and thinking about the world, which makes our judgments of life not shifting and casual, but necessary and right. Chapter 1. The Unsentimental Sentiment. Block quote. But the thing a man does practically believe, and this is often enough without asserting it, even to himself, much less others, the thing a man does practically lay to heart and know for certain concerning his vital relations to this mysterious universe and his duty and destiny there, that is in all cases the primary thing for him and creatively determines all of the rest. End quote. Carlyle. Every man participating in a culture has three levels of conscious reflection. His specific ideas about things, his general beliefs or convictions, and his metaphysical dream of the world. The first of these 
are the thoughts he employs in the activity of daily living. They direct his disposition of immediate matters, and so constitute his worldliness. One can exist on this level alone for limited periods, though pure worldliness must eventually bring disharmony and conflict. Above this lies his body of beliefs, some of which may be heritages, simply, but others of which he will have acquired in the ordinary course of his reflection. Even the simplest souls define a few rudimentary conceptions about the world, which they repeatedly apply as choices present themselves. These two, however, rest on something more general. Surmounting all is an intuitive feeling about the imminent nature of reality. And this is the sanction to which both ideas and beliefs are ultimately referred for verification. Without the metaphysical dream, it is impossible to think of men living together harmoniously over an extent of time. The dream carries with it an evaluation, which is the bond of spiritual community. When we affirm that philosophy begins with wonder, we are affirming, in effect, that sentiment is anterior to reason. We do not undertake the reason about anything until we have been drawn to it by an effective interest. In the cultural life of man, therefore, the fact of paramount importance about anyone is his attitude toward the world. How frequently is it brought to our attention that nothing good can be done if the will is wrong? Reason alone fails to justify itself. Not without cause has the devil been called the prince of lawyers. And not by accident are Shakespeare's villains good reasoners. If the disposition is wrong, reason increases maleficence. If it is right, reason orders and furthers the good. We have no authority to argue anything of a social or political nature unless we have shown by our primary volition that we approve some aspects of the existing world. The position is arbitrary in the sense that here is a proposition behind which there stands no prior. We begin our other affirmations after a categorical statement that life and the world are to be cherished. It appears, then, that culture is originally a matter of yea saying, and thus we can understand why its most splendid flourishing stands often in proximity with the primitive phase of a people, in which there are powerful feelings of oughtness directed toward the world and before the failures of nerve has begun. Simple approbation is the initial step only. A developed culture is a way of looking at the world through an aggregation of symbols so that empirical facts take on significance, and man feels that he is acting in a drama in which the cruxes of decision sustain interest, and maintain the tone of his being. For this reason, a true culture cannot be content with a sentiment, which is sentimental with regard to the world. There must be a source of clarification, of arrangement, and hierarchy, which will provide the grounds for the employment of the rational faculty. Now man first begins his this clarification when he becomes a mythologist, and Aristotle has noted the close relationship between myth-making and philosophy. This poetry of representation depicting an ideal world is a great cohesive force, binding whole peoples to the acceptance of a design infusing their imaginative life. Afterwards comes the philosopher, who points out the necessary connection between phenomena, yet who may, at the other end, 
leave the pedestrian level to talk about final destination. Thus, in the reality of his existence, man is impelled from behind by the life-affirming sentiment and drawn forward by some conception of what he should be. The extent to which his life is shaped in between these by the conditions of the physical world is indeterminable, and so many supposed limitations have been transcended that we must at least allow the possibility that volition has some influence upon them. The most important goal for one to arrive at is this imaginative picture of what is otherwise a brute empirical fact, the donier of the world. His rational faculty will then be in the service of a vision which can preserve his sentiment from sentimentality. There is no significance to the sound and fury of his life, as of a staged tragedy, unless something is being affirmed by the complete action. And we can say of one of the other that the action must be within bounds of reason, if our feeling toward it is to be informed and proportioned, which is a way of saying, if it is to be just, the philosophically ignorant vitiate their own actions by failing to observe measure. This explains why pre-cultural periods are characterized by formlessness and post-cultural by the clashing of forms. The darkling plain swept by alarms, which threatens to be the world of our future, is an arena in which conflicting ideas, numerous after the accumulation of centuries, are freed from the discipline earlier imposed by the ultimate conceptions. The decline is to confusion. We are agitated by the sensation and look with wonder upon these serene, somnambulistic creations of souls which had the metaphysical anchorage. Our ideas become convenient perceptions, and we accept contradiction because we no longer feel the necessity of relating thoughts to the metaphysical dream. It must be apparent that logic depends on the dream, and not the dream upon it. We must admit this when we realize the logical processes rest ultimately on classification. The classification is by identification, and that identification is intuitive. It follows, then, that a waning of the dream results in confusion of counsel, such as we behold on all sides in our time. Whether we describe this as decay of religion or loss of interest in metaphysics, the result is the same. For both are sinners with power to integrate, and if they gave way, there begins a dispersion which never ends until the culture lies in fragments. There can be no doubt that the enormous exertions made by the Middle Ages to preserve a common world view, exertions which took forms incomprehensible to modern man because he does not understand what is always at stake under such circumstances, signified a greater awareness of realities than our leaders exhibit today. The schoolmen understood that the question universaria ante rem or universaria post rem or the question of how many angels can stand on the point of a needle so often cited as examples of scholastic futility had incalculable ramifications. So that unless there was agreement upon these questions unity in practical matters was impossible for the answers supplied that with which they bound up their world, the ground of this answer was the fount of understanding and of evaluation. It gave the heuristic principle by which societies and arts could be approved and regulated. It made one sentiment toward the world rational, with a result that it could be applied to situations without plunging man into sentimentality 
on the one hand, or brutality on the other. The imposition of this ideational pattern upon conduct relieves us of the direful course to pragmatic justification. Here, indeed, lies the beginning of self-control, which is a victory of transcendence. When a man chooses to follow something which is arbitrary, as far as the uses of the world go, he is performing a feat of abstraction. He is recognizing the nominal, and it is this, and not that self-flattery, which takes the form of a study of his own achievements that dignifies him. Such is the wisdom of many oracular sayings. Man loses himself in order to find himself, he conceptualizes in order to avoid an immersion in nature. It is our destiny to be faced originally with the world as our primary datum, but not to end our course with only a wealth of sense impressions. In the same way that our cognition passes from a report of particular details to a knowledge of universals, so our sentiments pass from a welter of feeling to an illumined concept of what one ought to feel. This is what is known as refinement. Man is in the world to suffer his passion, but wisdom comes to his relief with an offer of conventions which shape and elevate that passion. The task of creatures of culture is to furnish the molds in the frames, to resist that, quote, sinking in upon the moral being, end quote, which comes of accepting raw experience. Without the transcendental truth of mythology and metaphysics, that task is impossible. One imagines that Jacob Burkhart had a similar thought in mind when he said, quote, Yet there remains with us the feeling that all poetry and all intellectual life were once the handmaids of the holy and have passed through the temple, end quote. The man of self-control is he who can consistently perform the feat of abstraction. He is therefore trained to see things under the aspect of eternity, because form is the enduring part. Thus we find in the man of true culture a deep respect for forms. He approaches even those he does not understand with awareness that a deep thought lies in an old observance. Such respect distinguishes him from the barbarian, on the one hand, and the degenerate, on the other. The truth can be experienced in another way by saying that the man of culture has a sense of style. Style requires measure, whether in space or time, for measure imparts structure. And it is structure which is essential to intellectual apprehension that it does not matter what a man believes is a statement heard on every side today. A statement carries a fearful implication. If a man is a philosopher in the sense with which we started, what he believes tells him what the world is for. How can men who disagree about what the world is for agree about any of the minutia of daily conduct the statement really means that it does not matter what a man believes, so long as he does not take his beliefs seriously. Anyone can observe that this is the status to which religious belief has been reduced for many years. But suppose he does take his beliefs seriously. Then, what he believes places a stamp upon his experience, and he belongs to a culture which is a league founded on exclusive principles. To become eligible, one must be able to say the right words about the right things, which signifies in turn that one must be a man of correct sentiments. This phrase, so dear to the 18th century, carries us back to the last age that saw sentiment and reason in a proper partnership. That culture is sentiment refined and measured by intellect becomes clear as we turn our attention to a kind of barbarism appearing in our midst and carrying unmistakable 
power to disintegrate. This threat is best described as the desire of immediacy, for its aim is to dissolve the formal aspects of everything and to get at the suppositious reality behind them. It is characteristic of the barbarian. Whether he appears in a precultural stage or emerges from below into the waning day of a civilization, to insist upon seeing a thing, quote, as it is, end quote. The desire testifies that he has nothing in himself with which to spiritualize it. The relation is one of thing to thing without the intercession of imagination. Impatient of the veiling with which the man of higher type gives the world imaginative meaning, the barbarian and the Philistine, who is the barbarian living amid culture, amends the axis of immediacy. Where the former wishes representation, the latter insists upon the starkness of materiality. Suspecting rightly that forms will mean restraint. There is no need to speak of vandals and goths, since our concern is with the, quote, vertical invasion of the barbarians, end quote, in our own time. I shall cite an instance from the modern period and from the United States, so symbolical of the world of the future. The American frontiersman was a type who emancipated himself from culture by abandoning the settled institutions of the seaboard and the European motherland. Reveling in the new absence of restraint, he associated all kinds of reforms with the machinery of oppression which he had fled, and was now preparing to oppose politically. His emancipation left him impatient of symbolism, of indirect methods, and even of those enclosures of privacy which all civilized communities respect. De Tocqueville made the following observation of such freed men, quote, It is on their own testimony that they are accustomed to rely. They like to discern the object which engages their attention with extreme clearness. They therefore strip off as much as possible all that covers it. They rid themselves of whatever separates them from it. They remove whatever conceals it from sight in order to view it more closely in the broad light of day. This disposition of mind soon leads them to contemn forms, which they regard as useless and inconvenient veils placed between them and the truth. End quote. The frontiersman was seeking a solvement of forms, and he found his spokesman in such writers as Mark Twain, a large part of whose work is simply satire upon the more formal European way of doing things. As the impulse moved eastward, it encouraged a belief that the formal was the outmoded, or at least the un-American. A plebeian distrust of forms, flowering in the eulogies of plainness, became the characteristic American mentality. Has America vulgarized Europe, or has Europe corrupted America? There is no answer to this question, for each has in its own way yielded to the same impulse. Europe long ago began the expenditure of its great inheritance of medieval forms, so that Burke, in the late 18th century, was sharply aware that the, quote, unbought grace of life, end quote, was disappearing. America is responsible for the vulgarization of the old world, only in the sense that like a forcing house, it brought the impulses to fruition sooner. It enjoys the dubious honor of a foremost place in the procession. Today, over the entire world, there are dangerous signs that culture, as such, is marked for attack, because its formal requirements stand in the way of expression of the natural man. Many cannot conceive why form should be allowed to impede the expression of honest hearts. The reason lies 
and one of the limitations imposed upon man. Uniformed expression is ever tending towards ignorance. Good intention is primary, but it is not enough. That is the lesson of the experiment of Romanticism. The member of a culture, on the other hand, purposely avoids the relationship of immediacy. He wants the object somehow depicted and fictionalized, or, as Schopenhauer expressed it, he wants not the thing, but the idea of the thing. He is embarrassed when this is taken out of its context of proper sentiments and presented bare, for he feels that this is a reintrusion of that world, which his whole conscious effort has sought to banish. Forms and conventions are the ladder of ascent, and hence the speechlessness of the man of culture when he beholds the barbarian tearing aside some veil which is half adornment, half concealment. He understands what is being done, but he cannot convey the understanding because he cannot convey the idea of sacrilege. His cries of Abbas de Profani are not heard by those who in the acceleration of breaking some restraint feel that they are extending the boundaries of power or of knowledge. Every group regarding itself as emancipated is convinced that its predecessors were fearful of reality. It looks upon euphemisms and all the veils of decency with which things were previously draped as obstructions, which it, with superior wisdom and praiseworthy courage, will now strip away. Imagination and indirection it identifies with obscurantism. The immediate is an enemy to freedom. One can see this in even a brief lapse of time. How the man of today looks with derision upon the prohibitions of the 1890s and supposes that the violation of them has been without penalty. He would suffer poignant disillusion had he a clear enough pattern in his soul to be able to measure differences. But one consequence of this debauchery, as we shall see, is that man loses discrimination. For when these veils are stripped aside, we find no reality behind them, or at best, we find a reality of such commonplaceness that we would willingly undo our little act of brashness. Those will realize who are capable of reflection that the reality which excites us is an idea of which the indirection, the veiling, the withholding is part. It is our various supposals about a matter which give it meaning and not some intrinsic property which can be seized in the barehanded fashion of barbarians. In a wonderfully prescient passage, Burke foretold the results of such positivism when it was first unleashed by the French Revolution. Quote, All the pleasing illusions which made power gentle and obedience liberal, which harmonized the different shades of life, and which by bland assimilation incorporated into politics the sentiments which beautify and soften private society are to be dissolved by this new conquering empire of light and reason. All the decent drapery of life is to be rudely torn off, all the superadded ideas furnished from the wardrobe of a moral imagination which the heart owns and the understanding ratifies, is necessary to cover the defects of our naked, shivering nature, and to raise it to dignity in our own estimation, are to be exploded as ridiculous, absurd, and antiquated fashion." Barbarism 
and Philistinism cannot see that knowledge of material reality is a knowledge of death. The desire to get ever closer to the source of physical sensation. This is the downward pull, which puts to an end ideational life. No education is worthy of the name which fails to make the point that this world is best understood from a certain distance or that the most elementary understanding requires a degree of abstraction. To insist on less is to merge ourselves with the exterior reality or to capitulate to the endless induction of empiricism. Our age provides many examples of the ravages of immediacy, the clearest of which is a failure of modern mind to recognize obscenity. This failure is not connected with the decay of Puritanism. The word is employed here in its original sense, to describe that which should be enacted off stage, because it is unfit for public exhibition. Such actions, it must be emphasized, may have no relation to gross animal functions. They include intense suffering and humiliation, which the Greeks, with habitual perspicacity and humanity, banned from their theater. The Elizabethans, on the other hand, with their robust allusions to the animal conditions of man's existence, were nonetheless not obscene. It is all in the way one touches this subject. This failure of the concept of obscenity has been concurrent with the rise of the institution of publicity, which ever seeking to widen its field in accordance with a canon of progress makes a virtue of desecration. In the 19th century, this change came visibly over the world, bringing expressions of concern from people who had been brought up in the tradition of proper sentiment. Propriety, like other old-fashioned anchorages, was abandoned because it inhibited something. Proud of its shamelessness, the new journalism served up in swaggering style matter which heretofore had been veiled in decent taciturnity. It was natural that so true an apostle of culture as Matthew Arnold should have sensed the mortal enemy in this. After a tour of the United States in 1888, he recorded his conviction that, quote, if one were searching for the best means to efface and kill in a whole nation the discipline of self-respect, the feeling for what is elevated, he could do no better than take the American newspapers, end quote. Is this why, 200 years before, a governor of Virginia had thanked God to the scandal of succeeding generations that there was not a newspaper in the colony? Have we another example here? of the evil discerned most clearly on its first appearance. What he beheld in germ has grown so immeasurably that today we have media of publicity which actually specialize in the kind of obscenity which the cultivated, not the prurient, find repugnant and which the wisest of the ancients forbade. In any case, it's been left to the world of science and rationalism to make a business of purveying of the private and the offensive. Picture magazines and tabloid newspapers place before the million scenes and facts which violate every definition of humanity. How common is it today to see upon the front page of some organ destined for a hundred thousand homes the agonized face of a child run over in the street? the dying expression of a woman crushed by a subway train, the tableau of execution, scenes of intense private grief. These are the obscenities. The rise of sensational journalism everywhere testifies to man's loss of points of reference, to his determination to enjoy the forbidden in the name of freedom, all reserve is being sacrificed to 
titillation. The extremes of passion and suffering are served to enliven the breakfast table or to lighten the boredom of an evening at home. The area of privacy has been abandoned because the definition of person has been lost. There is no longer a standard by which to judge what belongs to the individual man. Behind the offense lies the repudiation of sentiment in favor of immediacy. These are arguments founded upon insidious plausibility which seem to vindicate this publicizing. It is contended that such material is the raw stuff of life and that it is the duty of organs of public information to leave no one deceived about the real nature of the world. The assertion that this is the real world begs the most important question of all. The raw stuff of life is precisely what the civilized man desires to have refined or presented in humane framework for which sentiment alone can afford the support. The sensations pervaded by the press are admittedly for the demos, which is careless of understanding, but avid of thrills. We shall have occasion to observe in many connections that one of the great conspiracies against philosophy and civilization, a conspiracy immensely aided by technology is just this substitution of sensation for reflection. The machine cannot be a respecter of sentiment, and it was no accident that the great parade of obscenity followed hard upon the technification of our world. It is inevitable that the decay of sentiment should be accompanied by a deterioration of human relationships. Both those of the family, and those of friendly association. Because the passion for immediacy concentrates upon the presently advantageous, after all, there is nothing but sentiment to bind us to the very old, or to the very young. Burke saw this point when he said that those who have no concern for their ancestors will, by simple application of the same rule, have none for their descendants. The decision of modern man to live in the here and now is reflected in the neglect of aging parents whom prosper sentiment once kept in positions of honor and authority. There was a time when the elder generation was cherished because it represented the past. Now it is avoided and thrust out of sight for the same reason. Children are liabilities. As man becomes more immersed in time and material gratifications, belief in the continuum of race fades. And not all the tinkering of sociologists can put homes together again. It is sometimes said when this point is brought up that urban living renders relationships of the older kind impossible. There can be little doubt of the truth of the proposition, but the fact that it is put forward as apologia is an evidence of perversity, for motive is the decisive thing, and had our view of the world remained just, congested, urban living, harmful in many other ways too, would not have become the pattern. The objectification and Sticks and stones of our conception of living can hardly be pleaded as cause of that conception. When people set the highest value on relationships to one another, it does not take them long to find material accommodations for these. One is dealing here, as at every other point, with our estimate of the good life. In Megalopolis, the sentiment of friendship wastes away. Friends become, in the vulgarism of modern speech, quote, pals, end quote, who may be defined as persons whom 
your work compels you to associate with, or, on a still more debased level, persons who will allow you to use them to your advantage. The meeting of minds, the sympathy between personalities, which all cultured communities have regarded as part of the good life, demand too much sentiment for a world of machines and a false egalitarianism, and one detects even a faint suspicion that friendship, because it rests upon selection, is undemocratic. It is this type of mentality which will study, with perfect naivete, a work on how to win friends and influence people. To one brought up in a society spiritually fused, what I shall call the metaphysical community, the idea of a campaign to win friends must be incomprehensible. Friends are attracted by one's personality, if it is of the right sort, and any conscious attempt is inseparable from guile. And the art of manipulating personalities obviously presumes a disrespect for personality only in a splintered community where the spirit is starved to the point of atrophy could such an imposture flourish when the primordial sentiments of a people weaken there invariably follows the decline of belief in the hero to see the significance of this we must realize that the hero can never be a relativist Consider for the moment the traditional soldier, not one of the automatons that compromise modern armies as hero. It may at first seem paradoxical to say that he is of all members of the laity farthest removed from pragmatism, yet his is an absolute calling. Give him prudential motives, and he at once turns into a Falstaff, his service is to causes which are formulated as ideals. In these he is taught to hold above both property and life, as ceremonies of military consecration make plain. One sees this truth, well exemplified in the extreme formalization of the soldier's conduct. A formalization which is carried into the chaos of battle, a well-drilled army moving into action is the imposition of maximum order upon maximum disorder. Thus, the historical soldier is by genus, not the blind, unreasoning agent of destruction, which some contemporary writers make him out to be. He is rather the defender of the ultima ratio, the last protector of reason. Any undertaking that entails the sacrifice of life has implications of transcendence, and the preference of death to other forms of defeat to, quote, fate worse than death, end quote, is, on the secular level, the highest example of dedication. There seems little doubt to the ancient solidarity of priest and soldier, a solidarity becoming impossible today now that mechanized mass warfare has removed soldiering from the realm of ethical significance, rests upon this foundation. In addition, the disappearance of the heroic ideal is always accompanied by the growth of commercialism. There is a cause and effect relation here, for the man of commerce is, by the nature of things, a relativist. His mind is constantly on the fluctuating values of the marketplace, and there is no surer way for him to fail than to dogmatize and moralize about things. Quote, business and sentiment do not mix, end quote, is an adage of the utmost significance. It explains the tendency of all organic societies to exclude the trader from positions of influence and prestige. It accounts, I am sure, for Plato's strictures on retail merchants in the laws. The empirical character of British philosophy cannot be unrelated to the commercial habit of a 
great trading nation. Some form of sentiment deriving from our orientation toward the world lies at the base of all congeniality. Vanishing, it leaves cities and nations mere empirical communities, which are but people living together in one place, without friendships or common understanding, and without capacity, when the test comes, to pull together for survival. On the other side is the metaphysical community, suffused with a common feeling about the world, which enables all vocations to meet without embarrassment, and to enjoy the strength that comes of modern tendency. Our plea, then, must be to have back our metaphysical dream, that we may save ourselves from the sins of sentimentality and brutality. Does not its absence explain why, quote, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity? End quote. From the Collected Poems of W.B. Yeats. Without this grand source of ordering, our intensities turn into senseless affection and drain us, or to hatreds and consume us. On the one hand is sentimentality, with its emotion lavished upon the trivial and the absurd. On the other is brutality, which can make no distinctions in the application of its violence. Ages which have borne reputations for cruelty are more to be regarded than those renowned, as ours is becoming to be, for brutality, because cruelty is refined and at least discriminates its objects and intentions. The terrible brutalities of democratic war have demonstrated how little the mass mind is capable of seeing the virtue of selection and restraint. The refusal to see distinction between babe and adult, between the sexes, between combatant and non-combatant, distinctions which lay at the core of chivalry, the determination to weld all into a formless unit of mass and weight. This is the destruction of society through brutality. The roar of the machine is followed by the chorus of violence and the accumulation of riches to which the states dedicated themselves is lost in a blind fanaticism of destruction. Those who based their lives on the unintelligence of sentimentality fight to save themselves with the unintelligence of brutality. The only redemption lies in restraint imposed by idea. But our ideas if they are not to worsen the confusion, must be harmonized by some vision. Our task is much like finding the relationship between faith and reason for an age that does not know the meaning of faith. <laughs>